Let's solve a problem. An engine burns octane, C8H18, completely with 150% theoretical error. Determine a number of things, A, B, C, D, E, and F. First is get a balanced reaction equation. So the strategy when you're asked to get a balanced reaction equation when excess air or deficient air or anything is get first the theoretical error equation. Get it for 100% theoretical error and then modify it for the 150% theoretical. So we would write an equation like this. We'd say, okay, put the fuel, C8, H18. Where are we getting the oxygen from? Air, so we tag along that nitrogen. And it's going to be a one-way reaction. Sorry, reactants on, on the left, products on the right. And so we can just work through this saying to ourselves, do I have enough information at this point to even balance the carbons? And if I do balance the carbon, I can determine that coefficient in front of the CO2. And that coefficient in front of the CO2 is? Eight. Do I have enough information to balance the hydrogen? And if I do, I can determine that coefficient in front of the H2O. And I determine that to be? Nine. True? All right. Now, I usually stop at this point, and I do it in multiple steps because it's very error-prone, at least for me. It's 16 O's right there. Did I do that right? There's nine O's right there. When I add that, and sometimes I make errors in addition, it's 25. So now I can balance the oxygen, and I come back here, and I say, 25 divided by 2 will give me the right amount of oxygen. 25 over 2. I like to leave, personally, that's my call, 25 over 2. All right. Then I say to myself, I'm not going to have any oxygen left over because it's 100% theoretical. That's what I'm trying to establish. And I better finish out with the balance of the nitrogen, 25 over 2. 3.76 and 2. At this point, it's 100% theoretical error. It's balanced. Do you agree? Do I have any errors? Let's now modify this equation. If I was on an exam and I had plenty of paper space, I would rewrite the equation. But right now, to save space, I'm just going to modify in place this equation. How would I modify it? Well, we have 150% of the theoretical error. So I would put a coefficient right here, wouldn't I? 1.5. Does that make sense? And you can think of this error is going to be 1 plus 1 half. So 100% is going to go, of that oxygen is going to go to make the CO2 and make the H2O, but I'm going to have 0.5 left over. So now I modify and I'll have 0.5 times 25 over 2 O2s left over. And not only do I have some unused oxygen, but I have more nitrogen because more nitrogen came in. So to fix the nitrogen, and now everything is rebalanced. Did I do that okay? Right, okay, well, I would box this um, or whatever I want to do to finish it out and uh, say that that's the answer to part A. That's my balanced reaction equation. First few times, double check. Do it again for the carbon, do it again for the hydrogen, do it again for the oxygen, and do it again for the nitrogen. What is the dry product analysis? Well, you're asked for uh, calculating the mole fraction of CO2 and the mole fraction of oxygen and the mole fraction of N2, assuming that the hydrogen, uh, not the hydrogen, the water has been condensed in the products. So these are all the products over here, true? That's all the products? And so, let me clean this up a little bit. 
what would be the answer for the mole fraction of the CO2? Well, I would need the number of moles of the CO2 divided by the number of moles of all of the products except the water. So I look over here and I say, well, I would have eight moles of CO2 and in the products without the water vapor would be eight of CO2 and 0.5 times 25 over two O2s, oxygens, plus 1.5 times 25 over two times 3.76 N2s. Does that, does that equation make sense? And you can then compute that, sometimes I'll do it in two steps, I'll have eight divided by eight plus 6.25 plus 70.5 and then I'll have y of CO2 is equal to 9.4 uh, percent. And then you have the mole fraction of the oxygen and that would be 7.4 percent and the mole fraction of the nitrogen 83.2 percent. Box that. That's the answer to part B. Let's take a look at the mole fraction of water in the products. So now, don't condense it. Consider how much H2O are in the products. Well, it would be 9 moles divided by 8 of the CO2, 9 of the water, 6.25 of the oxygen, and 70.5 of the nitrogen. True? So I would have, if I didn't do have a dry analysis, it was considering water, what is the mole fraction of water in the product stream? That comes in at 9.6%. It's quite high, isn't it? So that's the answer, part C. Mole fraction of water in the products. What's part D? The amount of water produced in kilomoles per kilomole of the fuel. Well, I, I don't have a nice symbol for this. They're just asking me to compute it. I can introduce a symbol. I would say the number of moles of H2O divided by the number of moles of fuel. Isn't that what they're asking me to calculate? And maybe just, if, unless I have that more compactly summarized as a coefficient like A or L or some other K or something, I just leave it like that. I, I don't have a, another symbol like A over F or A to F is air to fuel, something like that. Well, so let's just compute this. And uh, so what we'd have is we have nine divided by one. How many moles of fuel, kilomoles of fuel are in my standard balanced reaction equation? One. True? So that's a kilomoles of fuel. So I have nine kilomoles of water vapor divided by one kilomole. Wasn't a whole lot of work to get the answer to part D, was it? Yes, sir? Uh, I have a question about part C. Okay. Yes, you need to consider that nine right here. Yeah, so it's the number of moles of vapor per the total number of moles of the uh, products, right? How about part E, the amount of CO2 in kilograms per kilogram of the fuel? So now we're saying, what's the mass of CO2 per the mass of the fuel? I would calculate that by reminding myself if I knew the number of moles of CO2, I can multiply by the molar mass of CO2. I'd have the mass of CO2. And if I had the number of moles of the fuel, I multiplied by the molar mass of the fuel, I'd have the mass of the fuel. And so to calculate that, I would look at my equation. I'd say I'd have eight. I have eight moles per one mole of fuel, eight moles of CO2. I have to look up the molar mass of my CO2, I look it up in the table, 44.01, and I have to look up the molar mass of the 
fuel. Now, you should be able to always estimate it, and you'll be very close. 12 for every carbon, 1 for every hydrogen. True? But you can get it more accurately. Um, so 114.22. And so the answer, the mass of the carbon dioxide per the mass of the fuel, comes in at 3.08. For every kilogram of fuel in, I get 3.08 kilograms of CO2 emitted. seems kind of weird at first, isn't it? Like, what are we doing here? Well, <laughs> the CO2 has a lot of oxygen. And it's, it's, it's heavy with the oxygen. Carbon's 12, but the oxygen's 16, and 16, that's 32. So most of the CO2 is oxygen. Yes, sir, did you have a comment? Uh, I was just going to ask, uh, the units for that question is limitless? It's kilogram over kilogram. So we can leave it off, just like I left off uh, this mole over kilomole over kilomole. But it's a particular type of kilogram, kilograms of CO2 per kilogram of the octane. All right, let's, yes? Yeah, the motor mass of this would be of the fuel. I look at it, it's got eight carbons, eight times 12, and it has 18 hydrogens, uh, 18 and hydrogen is worth one. And so what's that? This is uh, 80, 96 plus 18, that's 100, 114. So it comes in 114 versus 114.22. Well, you have on your exam the, the appendices and the table. There's two couple places where you can find the molar mass. Well, I wouldn't put it past me to say I'll give you one that's not in the tables at all, and you have to estimate it. Okay, so that is a Oh, absolutely. <laughs> yeah. You, you want to be able to estimate things as an engineer. It's a very good trait, good skill to have. Uh, without relying on a computer. How many people knew this, just show of hands, before I just explained it? I mean, that's kind of like 101 on chemistry, isn't it? Really pretty basic. Yeah, you, you may need to be reminded of it every now and then, but then you go, oh yeah, that's right, I remember. And then the dew point temperature, how do we calculate that dew point temperature? Well, we'd find the partial pressure that the vapor exerts in the system. That's the mole fraction of the vapor times the atmospheric pressure. Now, I reread that problem. I don't know what the atmospheric pressure is. You have to assume. You have to assume. So you're not going to be that far off if you assume just 101.3. Okay? We know that that's at sea level, atmosphere, over the world, average, you start moving up in elevation and it goes down, but you have to assume something, that's our standard atmosphere. So 101.3 for the atmospheric pressure. We count the mole fraction already, 9%. And so we find that this is uh, 9.725 kilopascal, quite high. The partial pressure of the water vapor in that product's going out. So we then look it up and we find that saturation temperature to has that saturation pressure of 9.725 and that dew point temperature, 45.2 degrees C. We did that last chapter, right? But it's good to see now that's pretty warm and that's why when you cool the products coming out of an internal combustion engine, you don't have to cool it very much and you get that white wispy vapor uh, condensation out of the tailpipe of your automobile, right? All right.